Zechariah chapter 10 then is uh, where we're going to um, begin this study, which you guys have uh, got open, no doubt. And here, the suggestion is, um, and I was kind of quizzed on this bit yesterday, and you know, don't feel like something I could say, give some absolute 100% answer to, that there's a distinction between the Jews in the land being referred to as Judah and the dispersed Jews who live around the world being referred to as Israel. And so you can see from the title of our talks that that's how we sort of worked on saying last night's study was on the restoring Judah and about them going to rescue the Jews in the land. Um, and today's study is going to be more about the Jews um, who are living around the world and then coming back in to the land. So it's not something that it's all the time feels super consistent. Okay, so you've got to like still I think, give it some thought. But I do think we can see it here. So let's just pick up in verse 3 of Zechariah chapter 10. Mine anger is kindled against the shepherds, the leaders, and punished, uh, punished the goats, for Yahweh of hosts has visited his flock, the house of Judah, and have made them as his goodly horse in the battle. So we're suggesting that's talking about the Jews in the land. But then when we keep going, we realize that there are still Jews who are scattered, who are living elsewhere. So um, verse six says, I will strengthen the house of Judah. Those people are saved the house of Joseph and I will bring uh, them again to place them. For I have mercy upon them. So there's the idea that Joseph is the ones who are scattered around the, the, the earth. So when it's saying then in verse eight, I will hiss for them and gather them. For I have redeemed them, and they shall increase as they have increased. That, that these people are going to be called, hissed, uh, like a shepherd calling for uh, sheep, and they're going to uh, come in. So, yeah, that, the idea of hissing there, I've got in my notes, like a shepherd whistling, calling for the sheep, and they'll be willing to come. Now, the phrase that we see in verse 9, I will sow them among the people, and they shall remember me in far countries, and they shall live with their children and turn again. Can you see in your margin again, I will sow them among the people. Um, Hosea 2 in verse 23. Now, I sometimes get into trouble with this because Sarah and I have different Bibles. So I don't know what Sarah's is, but um, uh, it's an authorised version, but like some, um, you know, a different one than mine. And she's constantly saying to me, you keep saying, look in the margin, and it's not there in my margin. Okay, so I've got an AV, RV into linear, and the revised version, although you might not like the version particularly, the marginal references in it are excellent. They're, they're time and again, they're kind of really, really helpful references to have. So I, I do seem to kind of you know do well in being able to kind of pick out some useful references. So against verse eight, I've got, you might have it, Hosea 2 and verse 23. So let's go to Hosea 2, and that's going to be one of our base passages this afternoon. It's just been a real pleasure doing this study with you guys as a group. Um, and I'm hoping this afternoon is going to be a real pleasure too. Okay, so on, we've got to kind of stick at this. Somehow we've got to get, work through this, haven't we? And uh, we're all maybe feeling a bit snoozy uh, on a Sunday afternoon, but we're going to try our best here. So in this passage, we've got a lovely picture of this work of restoration. And um, if we pick it up in verse 14, we're going to see this kind of lovely description of this. Therefore, behold, I will allure her, Israel, and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. And I will give her her vineyard from thence and the valley of Achor for a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth and as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be at that day, saith Yahweh, that thou shalt call me Ishi, and shalt call me no more Baali. For I will take away the names of Baalim out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. And in that day will I make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, the fowls of the, the heaven, the creeping things of the ground. And they will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth, and I will make them to lie down safely. And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto the, me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness and thou shalt know Yahweh. And it shall come to pass in that day, I will hear, saith Yahweh, I will hear the heavens and they shall hear the earth and the earth shall hear the corn and the wine and the oil and they shall hear Jezreel. And I will sow unto her, uh, sow her unto me in the earth 
and I will have mercy upon her that have not obtained mercy, and I will say to them which were not my people, Thou art my people, and they shall say, Thou art my God. So it's like a beautiful, it's like all these things, very, very poetic. You want to take some time to try and dig up the images and understand what's being said. And we'll try to open up some of them shortly. But I think in the end, it's summed up in chapter three and verse five, when it says, he's going to retouch, his, the, sorry, after which are the children of Israel return and seek Yahweh their God and David their king. Uh, and shall fear Yahweh and his goodness in the latter days. So, of course, this can't possibly be talking about David as a person. David has is, is, you know, fallen asleep long before Hosea was writing. He's using that as an image to help them to think about the fact that it's going to be that kingdom restored, but in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we might be able to kind of, you know, I'm not going to just bring out that just there, but start seeing some of the connections to uh, the idea of the work of Elijah here. Um, and certainly, as I say, the reference to David being their king is a sure reference to the Lord Jesus Christ being on the throne of David. Now, th there is a lot here, and we're going to try and bring some more of it out. But um, I want you to sort of just pick out, first of all, just look back to Zechariah 10 for a moment. So hold Hosea 2, look back to Zechariah 10. <clears throat> and we notice in Zechariah 10, we got this phrase which is the one that drew us to Hosea 2, in verse 9, I will sow them among the people. And my margin had Hosea 2 in verse 23. And the reason it would have had that is because that's the meaning of the name Jezreel, God will sow. So back in Hosea 2 in verse 23, this idea of Jezreel is the idea of God sowing, God being with them, being able to give them the fruit of the land now. And what we're seeing then is the place that Elijah gave up. Where did he give up at the end of 1 Kings 18? Jezreel, now being turned by God into something incredible. The people are now, the Jews are coming into the new covenant. And we know that it's the new covenant that's being spoken of there, back in Hosea 2 again, um, verse 18. I, I would with confidence say that the covenant being spoken of there is the new covenant, the gospel, the promises to Abraham. You know, they're synonyms for the same thing when we're talking about that. That the new covenant is one that's going to last forever, it says, verse 19. And verse 20, it's going to be based on faith. So do you see, this is what the new covenant is all about, the promises to Abraham. We also note that the Valley of Achor in verse 15 is turned into a door of hope. Now, if you again do a bit of study here, look at your margin for Achor. And my margin says that Achor means troubling. And I thought it was interesting that um, there in 1 Kings 18, I've given you the reference on the screen, in speaking to Ahab, Elijah has to say to him, I am not the troubler, I've not troubled Israel, but you, and partly because you've got us following Balaam. And God is now saying that the valley of Achor, that valley of troubling of people, when people are going after Balaam, is going to be turned around. Those aren't going to be the days anymore. So it says in verse 13, I will visit upon her the days of Balaam. That's not going to happen anymore. Verse 17, I will take away the names of Balaam out of their mouth. Okay, The door of troubling. The, uh, the Valley of Acor, the, sorry, the, uh, the Valley of Troubling is going to be turned now into a door of hope. And in your margin against verse 14, let's keep kind of enjoying sticking some of these things down. He says, I'm going to bring you into the wilderness and speak comfortably to her. There you'll see against your margin that that means to speak to the heart. And again, I, just all the time when I'm thinking, OK, we're looking at the restoration of Israel here. What is the restoration of Israel? It's about Israel coming back in. We know that there's somebody involved in that. We know his name is Elijah. We know that it says of him that his work is to turn the hearts of the father to the children and the children to the father. So again, all we're doing when we're looking at these things is thinking, that's interesting. We're looking at passages about the restoration of Israel and what we see are echoes into what happened with Elijah. So, so perhaps we are not being unfair to say that this is Elijah's work that we're looking at here. 
<laughs> we also see um, from verse 15 that it says at the end of the verse that them coming back to the land is going to be as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. So in other words, it's going to be an exodus. Okay, so there's the connections we've just been having a little look at. And there, as in the days when she came up out of the land of Egypt, it's going to be like as an exodus. And we're not surprised, are we, at the idea of the exodus language, because we remember that Elijah stood with Moses, um, well, having first of all stood like Moses on Horeb. We saw that in 1 Kings 19 yesterday and being taken back to Moses. But then even more significantly, we saw him stood at the Mount Tran of Transfiguration with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that they discussed the Exodus. So perhaps in discussing the Exodus that had been, in discussing the Exodus that the Lord Jesus Christ would lead, the ultimate one that would lead us out of sin, They'd also look forward to the time when Elijah too would lead an exodus of people who would want to come in to the new covenant, uh, Israel. Now, we also think from verse 18 that the Gentiles are involved in this. So look at this in verse 18. I'm going to make a covenant with them. So this is Israel, but it's going to be with the beasts of the field, the fowls of the heaven, the creeping things of the ground. Well, when I look that up, okay, what I come across is Acts 10 and verse 12. And can you remember Acts 10 is the reference where Peter is shown by God um, a vision of these things to say to him, what God has called clean, don't you call unclean. And it has to learn from that, that the Gentiles are going to come in to the hope of Israel. And he has to recognize that. So when it's saying here in verse 18, we look at it first of all and think, what? Yeah, what's that about? Uh, understandably. But actually just being willing to compare some scriptures with scriptures, looking these things up, you think, ah, perhaps that's what this is about. It's about the fact that we, uh, Israel, are going to be part of these promises. That's true. And it's also going to involve the Gentiles in this. So no wonder then it says in Zechariah chapter 8, do you remember this passage we touched on? In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, we will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. So this covenant that God is making you know, with Israel, yes, Israel are God's special people that he's using to bring about his plan and purpose. But God wants all people. How, how do we know that? Well, absolutely we know that. You know, you could go back to Shem, Ham and Japheth and just see that, okay? If you went into the early chapters of Acts and, and looked at the, the baptisms that take place, you'd see immediately that God wants all people. If you look at the individuals who are baptised in Acts, you'd see that God wants all people. Think about the individuals that you know that were baptised in Acts. You'd first of all get to Acts 8. What would you have there? Come on, this is interactive. Let's have it. Come on, Sam, Acts 8. Superb. Ethiopian Union. Okay. So where would he have been a descendant of? Shem, Ham or Japheth? Ham. Ham. Excellent. Okay. Acts 8. Acts 9. Who's baptised in Acts 9? Saul. Saul. Shem, Ham or Japheth? Shem. Shem. Acts 10. Who gets baptised there? <laughs> Cornelius. Shem, Ham or Japheth? Japheth. Okay. Now, don't tell me that God isn't interested in all people. God wants all people. He's driving his purpose, though, through Israel. But certainly God's covenant is with everybody and everybody benefits from this. OK, so let's just keep seeing some more passages about this type of thing. Isaiah 56, the sons of strangers that join themselves to the service, they're going to do OK. Why? Because it's a house of prayer for all people. OK, so, yes, it's got to be established somewhere, hasn't it? The place that God has established it is going to be in Israel, in Jerusalem, but it's for everybody. Okay, let's have another reference. Okay, Isaiah 49. Behold, I lift up my hand to the Gentiles. Okay, they're going to bring my son. They're going to come with the Jews too. They're wanting to be involved in this. And so that perhaps those three passages, okay, where we're going to put a note to those. I don't know, possibly against verse 18, but perhaps a better place if we're going to have a base passage, you know, you can tell I love a base passage, okay, uh, would be Zechariah chapter 8, wouldn't it? The end of Zechariah 8. That's the place to put our notes against this, isn't it? Okay, so let's get those references there. So, Zechariah 8, verse 23, cross-reference. Isaiah 56, verses 6 and 7. I'm giving you time. Next one. 
Isaiah 49 and verse 22. We're getting to a crescendo here. This is the summary one. This is a stonker. Now, if the fall of them, the Jews, be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. So Romans 11, the restoration of Israel. The, the it, restoration of Israel is going to be phenomenal for the whole world. Do we see that? Yeah? That actually, yes, through their fall, that we as Gentiles have benefited and that we have had this opportunity to come into the truth. But when Israel are restored and coming back into the new, or come into the new covenant, then the blessings are going to flow to all nations. It's going to be amazing, a phenomenal time ahead. So God will plead through, we believe, the work of Elijah. Those who will respond are going to start an exodus, coming back into the land of Israel, the promised land. And when they come, they're going to be able to be brought into the new covenant, baptised into it. Now, a further clue in, I'm back in Hosea 2, okay, so let's go back to Hosea 2. A further clue to um, this being the new covenant is those words that we see in verse 19. So maybe you've already spotted this when we were reading this through. He says, doesn't he, in verse 19, I'm going to betroth thee unto me forever. So it has to be the new covenant because this is one that's going to last forever. I'm going to betroth thee unto me in righteousness and judgment. What should be our cross-reference there? <coughs> what just happened then? <laughs> oh, this, okay. Welcome, sister. Okay. Uh, so, um, Genesis 18 in verse 19. Okay, remember that one? I know him, Abraham, and he'll command his children, his household after him, they will keep the way of the Lord to do judgment and justice. Okay, so that's uh, what's going on there. So against verse 19, Genesis 18 and verse 19. And then we've also touched on, haven't we, the fact that in uh, chapter 3, we've got this description of David being their king. So wh why would that be appropriate? Well, remember, David is the one who, who stretched out the kingdom so that we end up with that kingdom territory uh, that we, we looked at yesterday, going up to the Euphrates and, uh, and down into the Nile. And David, of course, is famous for the fact that he ruled, look at 2 Samuel 8 and verse 15, with judgment and with justice. He is one of those who is preserving the way of the Lord. So there we've got that picture of the, the kingdom territory, taking us back to Genesis 15 and verse 18. Um, yeah, so we'll come on to that in a sh shortly. So let's go back to Zechariah 10, okay? We, we left off in verse 9, picking up the connection to Hosea 2. But, but now let's look at Zechariah 10 and the concluding verses there. So remember, this is talking about Israel coming back into the land. I will bring them again also out of the land of Egypt from the south, and I will gather them out of Assyria from the north, and I will bring them into the land of Gilead and Lebanon, a place shall not be found for them. And he shall pass through the sea with affliction and shall smite the waves in the sea, and all the deeps of the river shall dry up and the pride of Assyria shall be brought down and the scepter of Egypt shall depart away. And I will strengthen them in the Lord and they shall walk up and down in his name saith the Lord. So I'd like to note the fact they're brought into the land of Gilead and Lebanon. Lebanon was where Elijah began his work. So if you think about 1 Kings 17, where we first meet Elijah, Zarephath, Zarephath is in the territory of Lebanon. So I think that in itself, up in the north, that's where they're going to be coming in. And we'll also see shortly that Gilead, I think, may well have some significance here as well. But we see certainly that that initial kingdom territory, which is on the screen there, is established. So you just think about that in terms of from verse, in verse 10, out of the land of Egypt, the land of Assyria. There is the, the kind of borders of that initial territory of the kingdom, the land that's promised to Abraham. 
And as the Jews journey to the land, they're either going to have to kind of come in through the Nile, it seems, or through the Euphrates. So in a sense, we almost have a picture of them being baptised as they come into the new covenant. But all the time, I think we're right to keep underlining the point about faith, because the apostle says in Romans 11, famous chapter about the restoration, if they, Israel, abide not still in unbelief, okay, they'll be grafted in. So let's just kind of turn that into the positive. When, it's when they have faith that they can be grafted in. Does that make sense? Yeah? It, God still wants faith for them to come into the new covenant. It's not simply that if somebody shows their passport and says, I'm a Jew, I can prove that I'm a descendant of, you know, Abraham, that God is going to say, great, you know, you, you are welcome into the kingdom. What God wants is faith. And so as in the first Exodus, those who have had faith and will be able to go, go through will be able to have safe passage. And I think that um, Isaiah 11 describes this. This is one of those passages we slightly touched on yesterday. It's a kingdom passage. And it's all about the fact that, uh, yeah, once they uh, get to the highway, they can come in to a point of safety, okay? Those brought into the new covenant will be given a place to live and the land will then get split into 12 regions. So that, that's the, high, the highway that, uh, you know, so think about that highway. There's the highway at Isaiah 35. But let's just see this land being split up. So here's an impression of how the land will be split up. They pick that up from Ezekiel 48 in terms of trying to describe how it is that the land will be split. And we know that the 12 disciples will have a job to be rulers, judges over the, those 12 tribes as they're split like that. So you can imagine people coming into the land, being given somewhere to live amongst those uh, 12 tribes, Jerusalem being the capital city where the, the temple will be. The, the Jews from Judah may well have a job, so Jews from Judah, what do we mean? We're sort of trying to talk about the Jews within the land already, may have a role in helping to convert the Jews who live elsewhere in the world. So where does that come from? Well, come to Isaiah 66, and that's where this idea comes from. So Isaiah 66, first of all, we're going to see, we're going to pick up in verse 15, the, the language of Armageddon, the suffering that's going to have to happen, the difficulties. See that in verse 15, Behold, Yahweh will come with fire, with his chariots, like a whirlwind, to rend his anger with fury, and his, and his rebuke with flames of fire. So you get that idea of the uh, suffering that's going to take part. Why? You know, why is God going to do that? Because Israel is godless as a nation on the whole. Okay? Not, most of them are you know, people of the flesh who just trust in themselves. And it needs to be cleaned, cleansed, as it were. And so, you know, we, we, if you read through verse 16 and 17, you realise that actually the slain is going to be many. Um, but that's needed because they're godless. They're just going after their own ideas. Uh, we might take from verse 17. Um, yeah, people that are certainly not following God's ways in any way. They live by their own standards. So this is why God would gather all nations. In other words, why Armageddon is almost necessary to help to cleanse the land. So then we go into verse 18. He says, um, I know their works, their thoughts, it shall come. I will gather all nations and tongues and they shall come and see my glory. And I will set a sign, the Lord Jesus Christ, among them. And I will send those that escape with them unto the nations, to Tarshish, Pul and Lud, and draw the bow, uh, to Tubal and Javan, to the isles afar off, that have not heard my fame, neither have seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. So the suggestion is from verse 19, that those who escape are those who escape the grim judgments of Armageddon. In other words, they come through it, perhaps the third that come through that fire, and God is going to use them to go out to the nations, to Tarshish, Paul, look, to all these places and those places that, you know, haven't kind of picked up what's going on. And then verse 20, they shall bring all your brethren. So they're going to help bring these people back in 
for an offering unto the Lord out of all nations, upon horses, chariots, litters, upon mules, and upon swift beasts. They're going to come to my holy mountain, Jerusalem, saith the Lord, as the children of Israel bring an offering in a clean vessel unto the house of the Lord. And then he says, I'm going to take of them for priests and Levites, saith the Lord. So it, the, the suggestion there is that in the, this process of this great judgment, that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come, he's going to be an ensign set up in Jerusalem, and then he's going to use even some of the people of Judah. Okay, but most certainly we think the, the saints could be involved in this too, Elijah too, involved in going out and bringing them uh, people back into the land. The Jews coming back, Gentiles too, saying, we've heard God is with you, we want to come as well. So they'll be sent out into the nations. Now, of course, whoever, um, those who, who are beginning that journey to Israel, not all will necessarily come with the right attitude or motive, as it were. We might ask, well, what is the right attitude? You know, what, what is it that they need to come back into the land? And I can't believe that by now you, you don't know. It's faith that God wants, isn't it? It's faith that we accept the fact we're sinners and we need to acknowledge sin in our lives. But in doing that, we recognize in faith that God has provided for us and his provision is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our means of salvation. That is what God will still want from his people. And so there in Hosea 14, it's the sort of attitude that God will want from them. O Israel, return unto Yahweh thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. Take with you words, turn to Yahweh, say to him, take away all iniquity, receive us graciously, you know, by your grace, not by our works. So will we render the calves of our lips. And I wonder if in Hosea there's been a, a hint of their attitude when it says, they shall sorrow in a little while for the burden of the king of princes. They'll recognise what the Lord Jesus Christ has been through. Uh, and I think that that's what's going on there. It's speaking of a time when scattered Israel come to understand what Judah has by this time realised, that the Lord Jesus Christ was and still is God's provision. And as Judah looked on him, they pierced and mourned. So many scattered Israelites will sorrow in their newfound understanding. But it would be foolish to think that human nature isn't still a terrible problem for mortal people. So among the Jews returning, there will be those whose motives are not good motives. They'll no doubt have heard of the blessings that are now beginning to come into the land of Israel. And some of them will be returning, we think, for purely selfish reasons. So, so why do we say that? Well, come to Ezekiel this time. Come forward to Ezekiel chapter 20. And this is the passage which would suggest that not all of those returning are coming with the right attitude of ones of faith and lit wanting to humble themselves, recognise sin in their lives, want to look to uh, God in faith and to his provision, the Lord Jesus Christ. So here we've got what we might describe as the rebels. Ezekiel 20. Verse 33. As I live, saith the Lord, Surely with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out will I rule over you. I will bring you out from the people, will gather you out of the countries wherein you were scattered with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the people and there will I plead with you face to face, like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness in the land of Egypt. So will I plead with you, saith the Lord God. And I will cause you to pass under the rod and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant and I will purge out from among you the rebels and them that transgress against me. I will bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn and they shall not enter into the land of Israel and ye shall know that I am Yahweh. So hopefully from going through that, you can see this idea that not everybody that comes will be able to go into the land. Uh, that the rebels, that, as it's described there, won't be able to go in. Now, notice how your margin in verse 35 connects to Hosea 2 
and verse 14, where we were a moment ago. This is talking about the same event of Israel being regathered into the land. Uh, and as they are brought into the wilderness, those who aren't sincere will be purged out. Uh, and I wonder if another cross-reference we might be able to put in our margin here is to Isaiah 27 and verse 12, where it says, It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall thresh, that's the idea, from the channel of the river unto the stream of Egypt, and you shall be gathered one by one, O ye children of Israel. So the idea of the threshing is that you're separating, aren't you, the good from the bad. So I wonder if that uh, is a reference to this same idea here. Now, the other thing that I want just to notice from this passage is that the phrase in verse 37, I will cause you to pass under the rod. I've got a cross-reference to Leviticus 27 and verse 32. Now, that's the only other place in Scripture where those words come together, and it's regarding tithing. So, very tentatively, we could speculate that perhaps of those coming in, a tenth will be taken and, and taken to be priests. They're going to be the ones who are chosen to be holy. Now, you might think, well, it, that is just a really kind of dodgy jump to kind of make that connection. And, and perhaps it is, but there is some kind of uh, backing up to the idea that some will be taken as priests from Isaiah 66. I will take of them for priests and for Levites, saith Yahweh. So I'm simply just, all I've done is, is put together a couple of references here. From verse 37, you're going to be passed under the rod. I look that up in scripture to pass under the rod. I come to the only other place it comes in, Leviticus 27. That it's the idea that being passed under the rod, that the tenth get taken to be holy. I think to myself, what does that mean? I notice in Isaiah 66, it says, I'm going to take off some of them for priests and for Levites. So you think to myself, perhaps that is what this is referring to here. Uh, something that, you know, easy to put in, have some question marks next to. Well, let's just um, keep kind of giving some thought here, because certainly those who do come in and trust in God, we see what's going to happen with them. Let's pick up in verse 39. As for you, O house of Israel, thus saith the Lord Yahweh, Go ye, serve ye every one his idols, and hereafter also, if you will not hearken unto me, but pollute ye, uh, pollute ye my holy name, no more with your gifts and with your idols. For in my holy mountain, in the mountain of the height of Israel, saith the Lord Yahweh, there shall all the house of Israel, all of them in the land, serve me. To anybody who comes into the land, these are people that are actually going to serve. There will I accept them. And there will I require your offerings and the first fruit of your oblations with all your holy things. So they're saying to them, isn't it? Look, if you're going to come in, your idols, your nonsense is, is going to have to go. So God is super clear, isn't he? He's saying, look, you're going to have a choice. Either you hear me and come into the new covenant, or you ignore me and you're an idol worshipper and I'm not interested in you. You stay out. Now, of course, the message for us there is hear God. Get rid of the junk, the gifts, the things that we might think that God is interested in, that he's not. And no doubt all of us in our conscience know full well that there are things that we have in our lives that we know God wouldn't be interested in. Get rid of those things if we're going to come into the land. The, the choice is there. What we've got to understand is that the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit a broken and a contrite heart. That's what God wants from us, isn't it? Isaiah 66. To this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit. Someone who's got the humility to tremble at my word. Not somebody who's got the, the arrogance to say, well, actually, I know how things happened. And what I'm going to do is now take some scriptures and just try and tie that into here. Have the humility to actually see what God teaches us and accept that what God says is true, as Abraham did. Well, Ezekiel goes on in verse 41 to say this. I will accept you with your sweet savour, and I will bring you out from the people and gather you out of the countries wherein you've been scattered. I will be sanctified in you before the heathen. And you shall know that I am Yahweh when I shall bring you into the land of Israel, into the country for the which I have lifted up my hand to give it to your fathers. And there shall you remember your ways and all your doings, wherefore, uh, wherein you have been defiled, 
and ye shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for all the evils that you did commit. And ye shall know that I am Yahweh, when I have wrought with you for my name's sake, not according to your wicked ways, not according to your corrupt doings, O you house of Israel, saith the Lord Yahweh. At the phrase in verse 43, you shall loathe yourselves in your own sight, I think he's saying they'll realise now the problem of sin in their lives. This is the poor and the contrite spirit. Once Israel acknowledged sin, God can save. Remember that phrase in Romans 7, who shall deliver me from this body of death? The answer, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so I think now that Israel, like those Jews who are already in the land, will have come face to face with the Lord Jesus. Seen him, they've pierced and mourned, loathed themselves, yet because of their repentance, their sin can now be dealt with because they have now got faith in God's provision, the Lord Jesus Christ, a faith which has come through instruction from God's word. We're going to finish with a passage from Jeremiah. It's a lovely, lovely passage. Let's go to Jeremiah 30. We're skipping a few things. We could have been in Isaiah 29. We could have been in Ezekiel in some other passages, Ezekiel 36, 37. But I recognise it's tough to, uh, to keep concentrating. So, Let's go to Jeremiah 30. And here, the prophet Jeremiah sees a picture of the return of Israel. And he sees it in a dream. Now we know that because in chapter 31 and verse 26, it says that Jeremiah woke up. Okay, so chapter 31 and verse 26. Uh, Upon this I waked, and behold, my sleep was sweet unto me. So you believe that from chapter 30 and 31, Jeremiah, through a dream, is seeing the restoration of Israel, the Jews coming back into the land. We know that Israel is being brought into the new covenant. We know that from um, Jeremiah 31 and verse 31. Oh, the days come, saith Yahweh, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day that I took them out of the uh, land of Egypt, which covenant they break. This is going to be the new covenant. And you'll see in your margin that cited in Hebrews 10. Um, it's all about the, the promises to Abraham. It's about the fact that we can have the forgiveness of sins. It says even, it spells it out for us at the end of verse 34. I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. That's what the new covenant is about. So, and again, you see that is cited in Hebrews 10 again and verse 17, okay? So this is what Jeremiah is seeing. He's seeing this vision of Israel coming into the new covenant. And you might also note in your margin, as you can tell I love doing this, um, just keep circling these as you go because I just think they're helpful. Again, at the end of verse 33, I will be their God, they shall be my people. Hosea 2 and verse 23, Zechariah 8 and verse 8, passages that we've spent some time in already. So let's try and think about what's happening then in this dream. What Jeremiah sees in this dream is a picture of Jacob gone by, years gone by, Jacob returning from Haran. Now Haran in the north, okay, near the Euphrates. Haran, and he's up there and he has to come back down into the land. And when Jacob did return, he had to cross the river Euphrates, and he came to Gilead. Why Gilead? Well, remember Zechariah 10? That's where they're coming into, Gilead. So there's a kind of picture that he's, Jeremiah's seeing, this vision of Jacob coming down and realizing that this is a picture of the restoration of Israel, those Jews who are gonna make this same journey when they come back into the land. And I don't think it's any coincidence that Gilead happens to be where Elijah also came from. Elijah was from Gilead. That's just interesting, isn't it? We see that, I think, okay, how fascinating that here in the restoration of Israel, they're coming into Gilead, that is Elijah's territory as well. Gilead means witness. And I think, again, it's lovely to think of this work as being about the witness of the Jews. And the Gentiles will see that if God can have mercy on them, surely they too can be saved. So let's look in Jeremiah now. You're in Jeremiah 30, 31. 
And let's see how, in a kind of really beautiful way, Jeremiah sees Jacob's return as prophetic of the time when scattered Israel will return to the land. So let's begin in chapter 30 in verse 7. Alas, for that day is great, so there's none like it, even the time of Jacob's struggles, thinking about Jacob. You see in verse 10, Therefore fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith the eye, neither be dismissed of Israel, for lo, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity, and Jacob shall return. Verse 18, Thus saith Yahweh, behold, I will bring again the captivity of Jacob's tents and have mercy upon his dwelling places. And the city shall be built upon her own heap. The palace uh, shall remain after the manner thereof. So you can see that he's speaking there about Jacob coming in, um, thinking about this kind of covenant they're coming into. Uh, if we kept reading down to the end of that chapter, you'd get this sense of them coming into the covenant. So then chapter 31 carries on with this theme of Jacob and now it becomes even kind of more apparent in terms of Jacob traveling back uh, as he did from Haran. So look at this now, chapter 31, Jacob still in mind, says in verse seven, thus saith Yahweh, sing with gladness for Jacob, shout among the chief of the nations, publish ye praise ye say, O Yahweh, save thy people, the remnant of Israel. Behold, I will bring them from the north country Gather them from the coasts of the earth, and with them the blind, the lame, the women with child. Interesting that Jacob, when he was travelling, had women with child with him. Her that travaileth with child together, a great company shall return thither. They shall come with weeping, with supplication will I lead them. And I will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters in a straight way, wherein they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. So you can see, can't you, that he's saying, they, I'm going to bring them, and I'm going to guide them back into the land. Just uh, keep looking at this then, verse 10. Hear the word of Yahweh, nations, declare it in the isles of far off. Say, he that scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd doth his flock. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. Therefore shall they come and sing in the height of Zion and shall flow together to the goodness of Yahweh. For the wheat, the wine, all these things, it's going to be good uh, when they come into this land. So here in Jeremiah, it seems to me that, that this is what they're seeing. That the, he's seeing this vision of Jacob coming back into the land. And what he's actually seeing is a picture that we are supposed to unpick of Israel being able to come into the land at that time. Being able to come into the new covenant. And in Verse 15, Jeremiah sees how distraught Rachel would have been at the scattering of her children. But now is the ultimate regathering. So the prophet goes on in verse 16 to say, Thus saith Yahweh, refrain thy voice from weeping and thine eyes from tears. For thy work shall be rewarded, saith Yahweh, and they shall come again from the land of the enemy. And there is hope in your latter end, the revised version says, saith Yahweh. And thy children shall come again to their border. I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself thus. Thou hast chastised me, and I was chastised. As a calf, unaccustomed to the yoke, turn thou me, and I shall be turned. For thou art Yahweh my God. Surely after that I was turned, I repented. And after that I was instructed. I smote upon my thigh. I was ashamed, yea, even confounded because I did bear the reproach of my youth. Now it's amazing to see Ephraim recognising, Ephraim scattered Israel, recognising they've gone astray, recognising that God has chastised them, but now they're coming into the new covenant. And I think it's amazing that the place that he touches in verse 19 is his thigh. Why would he go to his thigh? Because Jacob when he made that journey, can you remember that the angel touched his thigh and put his thigh out of joint? Why? To teach him not to trust in yourself, but to trust in God. So Jacob, for the rest of his life, walked with a limp so that he had this constant reminder, don't trust in the flesh, put your faith in God. 
And so now it's no surprise that as Israel comes in, into the new covenant, the place that he touches is his thigh. After I was instructed, it says in verse 19, I smote upon my thigh, just touching it. I was ashamed, recognizing now where they were because of the reproach of my youth, what we did to the Lord Jesus Christ. So now as they come into the new covenant, the hand touches the thigh because the Lord Jesus Christ surely is going to heal it. And the description he gives himself as a calf, it is in verse 18, is apt because it's the same phrase that's used in Malachi chapter 4. Unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. Touch the thigh and you will go forth and grow up as calves of the stool. I was as a calf unaccustomed to the oak, but now going to be able to go out leaping because the thigh will be fixed. So what a beautiful picture. Israel now growing up in the safety of the kingdom. So may it be that these exciting times ahead can spur us on. We recognise that the hope of Israel is our hope. We need to be amongst those whose faith comes from the word, the word of his grace, which is able to build us up and give us an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So some final lessons let's try to take. In the challenges of our life, we must live by faith. Hold on, believe that God is in control. And all the challenges that you come across in ecclesial life too, just keep trusting. We've got to get back to the word. It is written, is the way the Lord Jesus Christ dealt with the challenges in his life. If you're struggling to see those things in your life and you have times where your faith is low, look to the example of Israel. What an amazing witness they've been to the testimony of the word, to the truth that God is God. Do you remember those passages we looked at from Deuteronomy 28? Do you remember those lists that we went through yesterday? You think to yourself, how could this possibly be written by anybody else but God? Acknowledge sin in your life. And with that, acknowledge that God is justified justified to condemn sin and merciful to forgive. Remember always that God's word is the source of our faith. And so what would be a reasonable amount of time to give to reading and studying? Brother Richard, who's done a runner, said to me earlier in the weekend, how much time do we spend at the meeting? And he was able to just sort of do a bit of maths and say, you know, an hour here, an hour there. So maybe adds up to four hours a week, something like that. And then he said to me, what's 24 times seven? I didn't know the answer. I still don't know the answer, okay? But it's a big number, right? And he said, just think about that in terms of the time that we give. Now, of course, our daily lives, the whole life should be about service to God. But it is true, isn't it? To just give some time of reflection, to think to ourselves, how much time do we give to this when we genuinely think it's the word of God. Final thought. If Elijah's first work was a preparation for him and his work still to come, when he felt like giving up and believing that actually everything was against him, perhaps we should kind of take a lesson and think to ourselves, this could be our preparation. And although there might be times when we give up, there's going to be an amazing time to come when, can you believe it? Like you, would, you have to believe it, okay? We're going to be involved in kind of going up, saving the tents of Judah, bringing God's glory, like his amazing character, which is so good. When you compare it to anything that this world has to offer, we know it's so good. It makes absolute sense. And, and let this help you. The more you see morality just being watered down and, and compromised in, in the world, let that be something that helps you to see this makes sense. Hold on to this, my dear young people.